When a user performs a search on Google, what results are they most likely to click on? For 30% of users, nearly a third, the answer is, surprisingly, none of them. Before we get into that, though, I'm Mickey Mellon, and this is A Brighter Web, episode number 16, brought to you by all of us at Green Mellon. Our goal with this podcast is to give you quick weekly insights for news, products, and ideas so we can all make the web a brighter place to be. These might be actual web tips talking about strategy, search engines, WordPress plugins, and UX, or it might be productivity ideas to help you get more done and free up your time to do great things. We also want to thank our sponsor, ClickHost.com. ClickHost provides top-rate web hosting at prices as low as $5 a month. Visit ClickHost.com slash ABW for an exclusive 20% off discount for listeners of A Brighter Web. Today we'll talk more about search results that are never clicked, Twitter helping teams, Google's new Drive file system, AMP landing pages for AdWords and AMP analytical unification, editing business info in the search results, large sites don't rank better, and our tip of the week. Let's dig in. As I mentioned at the top of the show, 30% of search results are never clicked on. The reason, of course, is due to paid ads, as we've known for years, but also to Google's increasing push for knowledge box, rich card formats, various carousels, all that sort of thing. The way the numbers stand now, according to the article in Search Engine Journal, is the first organic result gets about 21% of the clicks on a page, number two gets 10%, number three gets about 7.5%, and they add up to about 70%, meaning 30% go to an ad or to the knowledge box or other places, never click anywhere else. I suspect over time this will get worse as Google gets better and better with their knowledge box results and other rich cards, but we'll see how it goes. But things are increasingly pointing toward fewer and fewer organic clicks in the search results and something to keep an eye on as we move forward. A while back, Twitter added team support to TweetDeck, but that was really the only way to have multiple people use a single Twitter account. Now they finally added that support to mobile on iOS and Android, making it much easier for multiple people to manage a brand account when they're on mobile. Some features are only available through TweetDeck on the desktop, such as managing members of a team, but now your team members on mobile can switch accounts between personal and business without having to share passwords. You can just give them access to their account, making it much easier for teams and agencies to manage multiple Twitter accounts. Google talked about it a while ago, but they're finally beginning to launch their Drive file stream. We use Google Drive at Green Mellon for all of our client notes and data and files and logos and all that stuff, and it's awesome. We used to use Dropbox, but Drive really just works better for us. We have about 400 gigs worth of stuff in there, so we selectively sync different folders depending on which computer we're on, how much space we have, what do we need. With FileStream, though, you'll be able to sync everything in a way. The files won't actually pull down until they're needed, but if you're on a fast enough internet connection, it'll act as if they're local and really should work quite well. Now, of course, this will depend on how fast your internet connection is and how you use files, but it could be a pretty nice way to essentially have all those files at your fingertips without having to eat up all that space in your hard drive. So. We have a link to the TechCrunch article that talks more about that, and you can read about how that's going to affect you in the coming months as Google makes the switch from Drive to the Drive file stream. A couple of pieces of news about Google's AMP project. The first one is you can now point mobile search text ads to AMP pages. It used to be they had to point to mobile pages on your site, but now they can point directly to AMP pages, making the results even better for your users as those should load much more quickly than even a well-optimized mobile page should. And Google's also adding analytics features to unify users across AMP cache and non-AMP pages. There's been ways to unify users across AMP pages and non-AMP pages on a single site, but Google has a lot of cached AMP pages as well, where it actually loads the pages from Google's server instead of from your own. And now there's ways to unify that data in Google Analytics as well. So your single piece of contact, regardless of where exactly it's hosted, will show up properly in Analytics so you can get a good idea of what people are browsing on your site. Google keeps adding more features for my business in the search results. They've just added a new one now where businesses can edit their listings directly in the search results. If you pull up your business in search, again, depending on some factors as Google rolls things out, you'll be able to edit in line to correct your information, your hours. You can do a post on Google, see some basic stats about your business, lots of neat things. Google's really working hard to get businesses to keep their information updated on Google. And for novice users especially, if they just see their business come up with an edit button there, it'll be a lot more likely that they'll make those changes right there rather than dig around to try to figure out how to make them through the existing channels. From Twitter this week, we see that Google has made it very clear that big sites don't get any kind of natural ranking boost. When asked, is there any correlation between the total number of pages versus rankings, Google's John Mueller said definitely no design connection. What this means is that a large site in and of itself won't rank better. However, well, in general, the sites might not rank better. You certainly have a good chance of getting more traffic to a large site because each individual page if assuming it has quality content, gives you a chance to rank for a different keyword. So it's not saying you shouldn't have large sites or shouldn't have lots of good quality content, but just that a large site in and of itself doesn't get any kind of ranking boost from Google. In fact, Google's even said a smaller site with quality content is certainly better than a large site with a bunch of bad content. So 
Continue to put out good content and lots of it if you can, but don't worry about making a site large for the sake of being large, but rather focus on the quality of your content. And lastly, for our tip of the week, this is inspired by Adam's suggestion on the Tech Talk Y'all podcast last week, but it's the Peak app, P-E-A-K, for brain training. I've talked about other apps on here, such as Anki and Brainscape, that help teach you specific things or help you memorize certain sets of data. Peak is more for training your brain to learn to think better, learn to memorize, not for the actual stats inside of Peak, but just for the drills that it does in your brain to help you learn more. They have a lot of science to support their efforts on how it can help, though there's always some controversy about these kind of apps. Uh, Sanjay Park said on the Tech Talk Y'all podcast, a lot of these apps only help your brain improve the specific games within the app rather than actually making you smarter in general. So that remains to be seen. But even if it doesn't help, I find the games challenging and enjoyable. There's a lot of free content inside the app, and then it has a paid tier that's relatively expensive. It starts at like $5 a month and goes up from there. But the free stuff is pretty good. We'll give you plenty to play with for now. But you can learn about that at peak.net, P-E-A-K.net, or find the app in the App Store or on Google Play. That's all we have for this week. You can find me on Twitter at MickMel, M-I-C-K-M-E-L, or learn lots more at GreenMelonMedia.com. You can find out more about the podcast, including show notes and links, as well as video tutorials and many other resources over at abrighterweb.com. If you're in the Atlanta area, come check out our meetup held three times each month. If you're not in the Atlanta area, we post recaps on the site soon after each meetup. Either way, you can learn a lot more about that at abrighterweb.com meetup. Thanks for listening.